Coming up on Market to Market. On the road again, the president takes TPP around the Pacific Rim. Spring storms twist and shout across the grain belt. And carnivores process cancer warning. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, May 27 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Mother Nature made it clear she was far from done with inclement spring weather as storms chased planters out of Midwestern fields. A storm system stretching across most of the nation was responsible for spawning numerous tornadoes and dumping several inches of rain. Multiple twisters struck Kansas during the week, with one tornado staying on the ground nearly 90 minutes. The EF4 cyclone plowed through 26 miles of Jayhawk farm fields and came close enough to the north central town of Chapman to damage a few homes. Regions of western Oklahoma received a few blows of their own as the storm system generated tornadoes that traveled across the Sooner State. As severe weather continues into the Memorial Day weekend, the president was wrapping up a journey of his own, hoping to salvage support for a trade deal weathering storms of its own. John Torpy reports. On his 10th trip to Southeast Asia, President Obama wasted no time promoting the positive aspects of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But some TPP member countries, as well as the United States Congress, have backed away from ratifying the treaty. On a visit to Vietnam this week, the president lifted an arms embargo and expanded relations between the two nations. With its burgeoning economy, Vietnam is becoming an attractive trading partner and Obama points to improved relations with the Southeast Asian country as an example of how successful the landmark trade agreement can become. We'll keep working to unleash the full potential of your economy with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, here in Vietnam, TPP will let you sell more of your products to the world and it will attract new investment. Obama pledged that under the 12-nation Trans-Pacific Trade Deal, Vietnam could reduce dependence on a single trading partner and enhance trade with others. One key element of the agreement is the lifting of tariffs between the member nations as a way to stimulate economic growth. Opponents of the partnership say the lack of tariffs will hurt American manufacturing as U.S. workers are forced to compete against low-wage jobs overseas. An independent analysis by the International Trade Commission, which was required by law when the TPP was signed in February, showed the trade agreement would create U.S. jobs. However, the gains would be low and the growth would be slow. Over a span of 15 years, the number of U.S. jobs created from TPP are predicted to only reach 128,000. Congressional approval of the contentious trade agreement has slowed dramatically during this election season, as the hot-button topic has come under attack on the campaign trail. Both of the presumptive candidates for president have expressed major concerns with the deal. And all indications are it's doubtful TPP will be addressed by Congress any time before the November election. President Obama's Asian tour took him to Japan, where he met up with the other leaders of the G7 nations. During talks in the Pacific Rim country, the president continued to try and gather momentum for TPP. Japanese officials are following the lead of U.S. politicians who are cooling to the trade deal. Eighty percent of the commerce in the agreement is expected to go between the U.S. and Japan. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. May is National Barbecue Month. 
For many, there's nothing like eating a juicy steak, thick cut pork chop, or a hot dog that has been grilled to perfection and plated with some scrumptious sides. However, many of these grill time treats have come under increased scrutiny in recent months, causing carnivores to process dystopian news about some of their favorite dietary staples. Josh Bittner explains. Last fall, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer labeled red meat a probable carcinogen, suggesting a possible connection to colorectal, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. The revelation stunned unsuspecting carnivores worldwide. I think we think about these guidelines as evolving. Um, it's been a pretty consistent message by many leading organizations, both related to cancer as well as cardiovascular disease, that red meat may increase risk. University of Iowa lecturer and dietitian Dr. Kathy Mellon says the conclusions of the 22 health experts from 10 countries tax on to decades of medical knowledge about diet and disease prevention. And it's difficult to also think about just how broad the category of red meats is to be able to pinpoint, is it one specific type? Is it the preparation method? The WHO poured over 800 epidemiological studies, but scant evidence prevented lamb, pork chops, and beef from being tagged with the most dire classification. That distinction was saved for other American food staples. Hot dogs, cold cuts, and bacon struck out with several global health authorities. There is enough evidence there for many organizations to say we should significantly limit the processed meats in our diet. Last month, the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund reiterated WHO findings that for every 1.8 ounces or 50 grams of processed meat eaten per day, the risk of lower stomach cancers increases by 18%. Experts say that's only enough to up the average lifetime risk of developing colon carcinoma from 5 to 6%, hardly comparable to cigarettes and asbestos, which now share the category of known carcinogens with salted, cured, fermented, and smoked meats. What do you think of that? I think everything causes cancer anymore, so... In Iowa, the heart of the bacon belt, a state with more pigs than people, many have taken the news in stride. Is it good? It's awesome. I think if you eat anything to an extreme excess, it's probably bad for you. Rather than wallow in disappointment, Go bacon! <laughs> this year's Blue Ribbon Bacon Festival, the Hawkeye State's immensely popular celebration of all things bacon, <laughs> took the occasion to point out that healthy lifestyle changes may tip the scales in favor of moderation. We are here to pump you up with bacon. Sometimes bacon gets a bad rap. With a balanced diet, you know, you can incorporate bacon into your diet and make it a healthy, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's good fat, good in protein. Tastefully clad Brooks Reynolds, the self-described face of bacon, and other founding members have seen Bacon Fest grow exponentially since its 2007 kickoff. Everything's good, it's wrapped in bacon, of course it's good. Over 10,000 people showed up in Des Moines this year, and the party has spread to other states and countries. But in the face of rapid growth, organizers both praise and scrutinize conspicuous consumption. I think it's the perfect food. It's salty, yet sweet. I don't eat bacon every day. I love it, but I don't. You know, they're kind of using scare tactics. You know, hot dogs are bad for you, meat's bad for you. You know, again, everything in moderation. Some dietitians admit quitting cold turkey is probably less than ideal for bacon aficionados. Instead, they say modest dietary adjustments present better options. If we think about the nutrient profile of processed meats, it's really not that great. So if you enjoy bacon, use it to flavor what you're eating, not as your sole protein source at that particular meal. Dr. Mellon adds student reactions to recent nutrition manifestos have run the gamut from confusion and denial to vegetarian considerations. Soy-based meat alternatives have been on the market for years. And proponents argue current methods of livestock and poultry production are environmentally unsustainable. California and Missouri-based Beyond Meat claims plant-based protein is the nutrient's purest form. 
And rather than let farm animals digest and convert it to meat, they go straight to the source. The company uses a variety of vegetable ingredients, common spices, and proprietary extrusion technology to mimic muscle fiber. But experts caution to check labels. Those products can oftentimes have just as much sodium, very little potassium in them, which doesn't make them any more nutritious than any other type of processed food too. So the message to consumers is if you're looking for a meat alternative, look for those that are really real foods as that meat alternative. Beef and chicken substitutes are available in many grocery aisles, but stand-ins for pork are largely absent. Livestock is traded in global markets, and pork is the most consumed animal protein on the planet. According to USDA, there are 67.6 million head of hogs across the U.S. Iowa is the nation's number one producer. Figures from the Iowa Pork Producers Association indicate over $6 billion in annual sales. All those cuts and conglomerations are both freshly cooked and cured to extend shelf life. And common preservatives like sodium nitrate and nitrite have become a major target of cancer warnings. But some niche producers assert that an uncured approach, utilizing natural safeguards like celery brine, may be safer and taste better. As minimally processed as possible is what we're about. Berkwood Farms, a co-op of about 40 family operations, supplies the Berkshire breed to the Blue Ribbon Bacon Festival, along with a range of products in Iowa and beyond. All of our products are a nitrite-free product, so I don't really consider ours as processed meat, um, like all the other larger corporations. Farmer Randy Hilleman says Berkwood Farms' production techniques have earned a reputation among discerning consumers who yearn for the good old days. It kind of started uh, 20, 30 years ago or 40 years ago when they, they started buying pork by lean premium. And so they got the pigs leaner and leaner and leaner. Well, the flavor is in the fat. And if you don't have any fat, you don't have the flavor. I don't know how many people have said that is the best ham they've ever had in their life, even 80-year-olds. Brookwood Farms hopes the appetite for nostalgia will help grow their business. And as medical authorities seek to first do no harm, debate over meat products will be processed by all stakeholders. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Technical buying appears to have been the real reason for this week's volatile commodity markets instead of the usual suspects of a cheaper dollar and South American weather. For the week, the July wheat contract gained 14 cents and the nearby corn contract added 18 cents. Meal has been feeding volatility in the soy complex as the July soybean contract gained 12 cents. July meal continued its upward trend, gaining 9.90 per ton, and that's a 50% increase in the past 90 days. In the softs, July cotton added an additional 261 per hundredweight to last week's gains. Over in the dairy parlor, July class 3 milk futures gained 20 cents. In the livestock sector, August cattle continued its downward trend, losing a dollar two. August feeders dropped a dollar twenty-two cents, and the June lean hog contract put on eighty-three cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index added sixteen points. July crude broke the fifty-dollar barrier for the first time in seven months and settled ninety-two cents per barrel higher. June COMEX gold lost thirty-nine thirty per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index rose more than four points, finishing the week at 371.45. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. You know, we talked about there how the cheaper dollar wasn't a factor this week because the dollar was a little bit stronger on the week. Is that strength in the dollar going to continue or are we getting a little toppy in here? 
I think the dollar is going to continue as we move a little bit further into summer. Uh, I think that the anticipation of the Fed's uh, move coming up here in June uh, at the FOMC meeting, expecting to hear after five uh, Fed presidents made comments this past week and indicating that, you know, we do need to have or should have uh, an interest rate hike. And Janet Yellen kind of hinting towards that direction as well. The market's going to be horribly disappointed if it doesn't happen in June, but I think we're going to anticipate it as we go towards that uh, meeting. As we anticipate it further, and maybe the dollar does gain a little bit of strength, does that open up some additional downside risk in this wheat market? What are your thoughts here on wheat? I don't think so. I'm very friendly wheat. Um, I think wheat has put its lows in. I think it did so on uh, Thursday of this week. We had some timing for that day. Uh, we also noticed that um, the market has been hovering on a trend line since, gosh, uh, November of 1999. And it also has been holding against a triple bottom of support in there as well, going back in history. And then on top of all of that, uh, the low this month of May has held the April low. And so it looks like we're going to close higher for the month and have an inside range higher monthly close. That's a sign of indecision. I think the market's gonna make higher highs here in the month of June. Now, we all know there are some pretty substantial bearish fundamental factors here in this That's wheat right. market globally and domestically. Those technical factors you think will be will have enough strength to continue to provide some, some upward momentum here? Well, it's always been my take that the, uh, the fundamentals are your trend. And we certainly have, you know, it's like, how low do you go to price all that in? Funds are heavy, heavy short. And so that's going to be help of a driving force. Um, I would go back and point out soybeans and corn and just say, hey, there was signs that we could be getting something better this year. A lot of people didn't want to believe that. Um, but you have to remember, we always turn to tighter supplies, more of an optimistic outlook from really negative uh, fundamentals, so to speak. The opposite is true when the market's in a bull trend. Uh, so I look at, uh, first off, you've got India. Uh, they look to be good importers this year of wheat. Um, we're changing. If you look at the foreign production deficits, uh, wheat in this May report went from not needing us at all in April to needing us this next uh, crop year as we go forward. Uh, basically, they're gonna, it's not the biggest switch I've seen in history, but that shift is coming. And that's even with the thought that we're gonna produce more. If the world is changing and getting better and, and progressing more economically, that means you're gonna have more demand for things. And in the meantime, prices are cheap. That allows you to consume more as you produce more. So I think that uh, with India, their uh, uh, demand is exceeding what they're producing this year by nine and a half million metric tons. Wow. Um, you look at South America, and of course, Brazil imports Argentina's wheat a lot, but I think they're gonna be importing some maybe from us too. But the biggie for the US, if you look at our crop condition ratings, they are quite high. And the winter wheat, as you noticed in the prelude of this show, was they've been having some issues, but it's wet weather. And the next 10 days is forecast to continue to be wet okay. for that area. You continue to be wet, now you're talking about concern of sprouting in the heads, mm -hmm. holding back harvest, and not getting the harvest progress fast enough to be able to come back in on the backside and plant beans. So we might have enough to scare those shorts out of the market and keep moving this thing higher. I think we've already started. All right. Now, Sue Martin, as we take a look at this corn market, mm -hmm. closed above $4.10 in the December 16 contract, highest close in that contract since July. Do we have strength here to continue pushing? Are we just starting to climb this mountain or are we nearing the peak? Well, you know, wonders never cease, do they? But I think that when I look at the corn market, it's like it's been chipping away at stone and just been relentless. It just keeps coming on and coming on. And I think that uh, what we have to keep in mind is that this is a market that has been so sold bearishly. You know, you come into the crop year and they said, we weren't gonna have very good exports. We were gonna lag behind. And we're running up right up neck to neck with a five-year average, if not a hair over it now. And you've got China. This is just this week, we have been selling a lot of old crop corn into unknown destinations. Today, the USDA announced first it was China, and then they switched it over to unknown destinations. Maybe that's a faux pas. 
But um, I think that's all in the face of China saying they want to get rid of about 238 million metric tons of grain, of corn. That's probably really in poor mm -hmm. quality. And so, you know, you're looking at uh, soy meal that's had a huge move. That's supportive to corn. You look at this corn crop. And you look at these fields, and it's not just in Iowa, it's in other surrounding states. It's a big area. But for, it started off looking like it was going to be an early spring, mm -hmm. be it whether it was Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, wherever. And that corn, because of the cool temps, all of a sudden the corn hasn't done anything. And the late planted corn, it's all the same size. What it says is, we're going to pollinate all together. That's going to put some enthusiasm in this market later on if they start talking about heat. Well, and speaking of weather, we've got a question here from Randall in Harco, Illinois. He's asking, do you think there are enough acres in southern Illinois, southern Indiana, and Ohio that aren't getting planted to provide some spike before we get to the heat of pollination? Well, you probably have seen a little bit of that. Okay. But I think more than anything, um, you know, you look at livestock numbers. The cattle on feed report, if they thought that was so bearish to be limited down, that should have been very friendly to corn mm -hmm. because placements, that's more cattle you're feeding. Right. Albeit, you know, we've got 120 day cattle down 5%. But uh, regardless, the, the corn market's got demand. Okay. And then you've got Brazil sold out of corn, having to import their saffrona crop, which is their largest percentage of the, what they produce in a year, is down substantially and the weather's not changing. All right. They're having to import. Corn's going higher. You may get some little bit of correction because okay. of temporary overbought. Don't be scared of it. It's going to go higher. Okay. Now let's my talk perception. soybeans, Sue Martin. Same story. Incredible rally in this market. It seems like we are getting a little toppy in there. We haven't been able to take out those highs that we put in when this thing first jumped up. Where do we go from here? Well, first off, can I just step back to corn first? Briefly. Okay. Um, foreign production deficit on corn really increased here in the month of May from April. And it did so by just shy of 6 million metric tons that the world was going to need. This is the third year in a row that we have a growing foreign production deficit. Mm -hmm. But it didn't stop there. In 2016-17, that foreign production deficit almost ties, I think, maybe the third greatest need by the foreign buyer. Okay. So that should be a little underpinning. Doesn't mean we have to go higher, but what it says is just give us a little problem. The global and demand is there. Yeah, well, the demand's there, and then you give a little bit of a problem on concern of supply and production out of the U.S. because we're number one, mm -hmm. and that's going to stoke that corn market. And then with those huge gaps, oh, that, that thing's going to be relentless. Okay. Beans, still got some upside room here? Well, I think beans has to be, you know, it's a market that's really gone quite a ways. It's always been a favorite of the specs and of the funds to, to go into beans. And, and beans certainly have a good bullish story, but they've had this now. But I think that we have yet to play the U.S. card, and so that'll probably come. But what I think in the bean market is, um, it looks to me like we possibly could have done a double top. Okay. But this market isn't acting like it really wants to break down real easily. What could happen is you could come back down maybe 1065, maybe 1050, 45, something like that. Watch that 1044 area. There's good support there. That could start to break you down if we break that out. Okay. But you could come down to that, then turn and start to take another leg on this. Um, I kind, I don't think our highs are in for the year on beans. Okay. Um, but you know, it doesn't mean you can't mess around a little bit first before you get there. I heard that supposedly Argentine farmers really picked up some slack of selling on Thursday. So be it. They really have been dragging their feet on selling beans because that's a 30% okay. taxation as opposed right. to corn that they're moving into Brazil. Uh, where they p don't pay any tax at all. You bet. Now, Sue, we don't have much time left, but on these livestock markets, are is the breakdown done in cattle, live uh, cattle at 116? I think so. Um, I thought Thursday's behavior was phenomenal. You know, of course, they kind of, you know, drew out a lot of cash cattle when everybody threw their hands up in the air and said, okay, when that mm -hmm. market was breaking down 150, 200 points, everybody kind of threw in the towel and then only to turn around about face and do a huge reversal. I think that's a good sign. You know, like I said, the 120 day cattle are down 5%. Um, you've got exports uh, for the month of May, uh, beef exports are up 10%. 
Uh, you've got pork exports up 15 percent, um, you know, and that's even in the face of Russia not being around. Right. You know, so that's really good. And then on top of it, you've got this uh, choice select spread at $20. Um, I think that speaks to you as to how well the producer has been pushing cattle ahead, shoving them closer to market, and they've had every incentive to do so. But now that the June is off the board, you're looking at, what are we, uh, maybe 125, 126 to 116, mm -hmm. 117. Uh, but 120 will be kind of a little bit okay. of a benchmark to 122. I think your cash will be stronger next week. And I think that uh, the product will start to base out in here and turn higher, too. All right. Feeders higher or lower this next week? Oh, I think they'll be higher. Okay. Taking I like some feeders. cues from the, the fat cattle. I think I would. Okay. Um, we have indicators we use. They're kind of, one of them is starting to show signs of a turn. All I can say is, Mike, when we get our weekly indicators t cleaned up, and we're working on that, we're not far from it, and ironically, October cattle came within $2 of a wave four from the all-time high. I think that that speaks well for this market. And I still think there's something better in this cattle market this year. Um, now, of course, the nemesis will be corn going higher mm -hmm. for that uh, grain uh, market, but we'll see. Okay. Um, but I do think that the cattle market, this monthly data that I look at, it's just sitting and waiting to get this other stuff out of its system, and then it's like all you know the lights will be green. All right, so ten seconds to go. Oh. Lean hogs close know. higher or lower on next Friday. Oh, I'm gonna say, okay, what the heck? I'm gonna say higher. Higher. All right, okay. we got a little bit of a bullish on the lean hog market. I was gonna tell you, I can't talk in ten seconds. <laughs> I know, Sue Martin. Thanks so much for taking the time to join Thank us. Thank you. And that wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But Sue and I are not done talking. We will keep the market discussion going and answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. And if you believe in this service that's been provided each and every week for the past 41 years, go to the upper right-hand corner of the homepage and help support future editions of the program. And join us again next week when we'll examine how a producer co-op is helping tobacco farmers transition to new crops. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company, offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.